Welcome back to Mafia. And in this Audio Boom original podcast series, we explore America's criminal underworld to reveal the lives and careers of its greatest gangsters. This episode is sponsored by ShipStation. Previously on Mafia. Joe Pistone, uh, a fantastic FBI agent, a real hero, and should be seen as a hero by the American public. Someone who actually put his life on hold to really get to the, the root of uh, a segment of organized crime in the United States and put his life on, on the line, really. Known to the mob as Jewel Thief Donnie Brasco, FBI Special Agent Joe Pistone went deep undercover to become an active member of the New York underworld. Well, at this stage, I was gathering uh, a lot of uh, uh, intelligence information, but I also was gathering evidence on, uh, on drug deals, extortion, uh, hijacking, political, you know, corruption. Uh, so it was a, a mirror of, of, of information. Joe Pistone gathered, you know, the very uh, bread and butter <laughs> of the organized crime family he was involved in. He sat in their meetings. He could recount the power structure. He could recount to us who was in, who was out. He could recount what rackets they were involved in. He could recount what's coming up in the future. He could recount the, uh, the, the people he was involved in were particularly vicious. You know, who was gonna kill who or who was on the outs or, you know, he was right at the very seat uh, of uh, that organized crime family. Uh, so he knew everything that was going on, pretty much. This is Mafia. Nineteen seventy-eight, New York. After two long years, Joe Pistone was now undercover inside the city's Bonanno crime family, working alongside such ruthless gangsters as Tony Mira and Benjamin Lefty Ruggiero. Tony Mira was a Bonanno, a, a major drug dealer in the Bonanno family. Uh, he had just gone out of jail not, uh, not long before I met him. Um, the guy was, was just one mean guy. Mira was just plain mean. I mean, uh, nobody liked him, but he, he made tons of money for the family through, you know, through his drug uh, dealings. And when Tony Mira went to prison for drug trafficking, Pistone took another step toward one of the most powerful captains in the Bonanno family, Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano. Selwyn Rabb is a mafia expert and author of Five Families. Sonny Black was an effective, important leader, a capo. He had about 15 to 20 members in his uh, crew, about 10 or 12 made guys and probably at least 20 or 30 other well, known as associates or wannabes who hang around and work with the family. Pistone had taken to hanging out daily with Sonny Black at his social club, the Motion Lounge in Brooklyn. Now he saw a way to expand his operation by vouching for other undercover agents, those who were operating elsewhere in the States targeting other mafia families. The FBI had other undercover operations going throughout the country, and one of them was in, uh, was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, they had an operation going where they were attempting to infiltrate the, uh, the Milwaukee family. And the boss out there was a guy by the name of uh, Frank Balistrari. And they, you have to uh, understand how, to, how it operates. Uh, Milwaukee is aligned with the Chicago mafia. And uh, they had the operation going out in, uh, in Milwaukee, an undercover operation. It was a vending machine. Uh, business and they were hoping that they were able to uh, hook up with, with Balistrari who uh, controlled all the vending machine business uh, in Milwaukee and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, they weren't having such great luck so <clears throat> uh, the FBI headquarters contacted me and said you know you think you can uh, arrange a meeting between the Bonanos and, and the Balistraris. And uh, first of all, I wanted to know who the undercover agent was, and it was, it was an undercover agent by the name of Ty Cobb, who I knew and was a great undercover agent. And I said, well, let me see what I can do. Now, I can't just go to Lefty or Mike and say, hey, you know, let's go out to Milwaukee, you know. I got to drop hints, you know. And again, I didn't want to uh, put myself in a position where if 
they didn't want to do it. They come back and blame it on me, you know. So I said, you know, I get contacted by this guy that I knew 10 years ago. He's out in Milwaukee. He's trying to open up a vending machine business. And the first thing Leslie says, what, what is he crazy? They'll blow him up out there. They, they, they blow people up out there. The guy says he has like $100,000, you know, uh, to get this business going. So that piques his interest. So he says, why don't you go out there and, and check it out? So I fly out to Milwaukee. Of course, now all of this is set up before with, with the undercover agent, you know. And, you know, they do have an operation going. He, he's got a, an office. He's got vending machines. He's got a couple trucks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I come back and I tell Lefty, yeah, he's got, you know, he's got everything he says he has. So now Lefty has to get permission from Mike Sabella. So we go to Mike, we explain it to him. He says, all right, you and Lefty fly out there, sit down, talk to the guy, and see, you know, you see what's happening, Lefty. So me and Lefty fly out to Milwaukee. We go through this whole thing, take him, take Lefty to see the, the office, uh, the machines, the trucks. We uh, go to Mike Sabella and tell him. Now, we can't go out there without getting permission from Milwaukee, from the boss of Milwaukee, because we're a mafia family out of New York, so we can't go out there and and uh, become involved in this this company. So what happens is that the Bananos in New York have to call Chicago. Chicago has to call Balistrieri and set up a meeting, set up a sit down, is what they call it, and that took about maybe three weeks a month. And finally, said, "Okay, come on out." So we go out uh, and we sit down with, with Balistrieri and his people and they form a marriage uh, as far as the, the vending machine business goes. It was the first time an FBI agent had ever sat down with such a high-ranking mobster. More after a word from our sponsor. When you're selling online, Getting your orders out the door quickly can be tough. Whether you work for a huge corporation or you're starting your own small e-commerce side hustle, there are a lot of delivery options, and you want to make sure you're making the best, most cost-effective choices for your business. And that's why you need ShipStation. ShipStation works with over 75 popular selling channels. This includes Shopify, Squarespace, Etsy, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, whichever one you use. ShipStation integrates with most online storefronts and marketplaces. I'm talking about the Postal Service, eBay, UPS, DHL, you name it. And they help you streamline the process and keep your customers happy. Once you've found just the right carrier, you can choose the fastest shipping option, adjust the shipping by date, and add custom templates and custom documents. Plus, ShipStation is available in the UK, Australia, Canada, and of course the good old US of A. Maybe you're shipping mid-century modern furniture, apparel, vintage action figures, customized leather goods, whatever. Trust me, you're going to love ShipStation. Right now, try ShipStation free for 30 days. Plus, get a special bonus when you use promo code MAFIA. Don't wait. Go to ShipStation.com before you do anything else. Click the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in M-A-F-I-A. That's ShipStation.com. Enter M-A-F-I-A. ShipStation. Make ship happen. At the same time, the FBI had also been attempting to infiltrate the mafia in Florida. But then there was another undercover operation in, in uh, out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, uh, FBI had a nightclub. They were trying to get in with Santo Traficani, who was a boss of Florida. The FBI hoped the club, the King's Court, would be a beacon for the state's mobsters. Five undercover agents pretending to be mob wannabes from the north ran the club, while the staff of civilians, bartenders, waitresses, even a piano player, were completely unaware they were working for a covert FBI operation. But so far, the operation had failed to attract major mafia players. Bureau headquarters asked me if I could bring my banano guys down there. And, you know, it's the same routine. Uh, I 
I got, you know, I got contacted by a guy that I knew years ago. Uh, and he's got a nightclub, and that, you know, everything perks up the years because it's a nightclub, it's money, it's in Florida. The Stones suggested becoming a partner in the King's Court to Sonny Black. Intrigued, Sonny sent Pistone and Lefty Ruggiero to Florida to check it out. Everybody thinks that uh, that mob guys are, uh, are so worldly and they know everything. I mean, they're really parochial. It's, it's basically their neighborhood is that, you know, uh, is where all their knowledge lies. And Lefty was no different. Uh, uh, I mean, in the beginning, it's like we'd make plane reservations and, you know, had no idea how to make a plane reservation, you know, because a lot of time, most of the time, when they wanted to go somewhere, the plane tickets were, you know, back in, in the day before the computers, it was all, they were stolen, you know, from, from travel agents. Once in the Sunshine State, Pistone worked hard to impress Lefty and build new links with local gangsters. Lefty was a boat guy. I mean, he knew boats. Uh, he didn't have any boats when I knew him, but, but he always had boats. But uh, he knew boats, yeah. The FBI had a boat down out of Miami. And we used to go to Miami a lot. Uh, and we were down there one time with a bunch of, bunch of gangsters bunch of the guys from New York and uh, they wanted to go fishing. So I got in touch with the FBI and I said, hey, can we use this boat to take these guys fishing? So they said, yeah, it was an undercover boat. And, you know, the captain was an FBI agent who was licensed and everything. And they said, yeah. So we go out, go fishing all day. After receiving a favorable report from Lefty, Sonny decided he wanted in. But to operate in Florida, he would need the permission of the local mafia boss, Santo Traficante. That's when Sonny then starts moving ahead to get a meeting with Traficante. Sonny and Traficante agreed to run illegal gambling operations together from the club. For the FBI, it was a groundbreaking achievement. Here we got two major bosses that we married up together to become involved in illegal activities with. I mean, unheard of. So that's, uh, uh, that was a big thing. The King's Court Club was ready for business, with special features added by a Florida undercover going by Tony Rossi. King's Court was wired for audio and video, but it was only in the office, not the club, because the patrons were regular people who didn't know it was an FBI operation. In in uh, in Florida, uh, Rossi had a uh, across the street from the King's Court. They had an apartment where the feed from the audio and the video went. Uh, so he always had uh, a couple guys in that apartment uh, monitored in the office with the audio and the video. When you're recording and monitoring something, you know you got to have guys there looking at it all the time. For the FBI, it was a gold mine of intelligence. For Sonny Black and the Bonanno family, it was a more literal gold mine. Every time you went to the club, it was packed. I mean, <laughs> uh, it was a big hit among the locals, you know, and everybody that was in there was a, was a citizen, you know. So the club was making money. We're doing illegal gambling, casino nights, and illegal b bingo games, which was big down there because of the elderly population. Uh, you can make a lot of money running bingo because they were taking the, the big cut for themselves. Sonny Black was so impressed with Pistone that he asked him to head up the operation in Florida. You know, at this point, he says, look, he said, I want you to, you know, he said, I know you were lefty. Uh, he said, but now, he said, I want you to report directly to me. Uh, and uh, I was, that's another bad position I'm in because now I know lefty's going to get ticked off because, uh, you know, it, it, it's that envy and jealousy thing against in the mob. Even though Sonny's the captain, you know, I'm Lefty's partner. Uh, so when I tell him that Sonny now wants me to report directly to him, this sets Lefty off. Uh, so you know, I gotta, I gotta placate Lefty. That left, I'm still your partner. You know, he's the captain. Uh, I'll go along with what he says, but you know. 
you're still my man. Uh, so uh, you got to walk a fine line there because uh, you can't take off the captain, but you can't take off Lefty either. Pistone now had direct access to one of the most important captains in the New York Mafia. I got to know Sonny Black pretty good, and uh, although he, you know, although he was a stone cold killer and a gangster, uh, Sonny was the kind of guy you could spend time with. I mean, you know, he would talk about the gambling, the drugs. He would talk about, you know, who's the power in the family. All that. But you could also have other conversations with him. Uh, he would talk about his kids. Uh, he wasn't a bad guy to be around one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, he liked to joke a lot, you know, uh, practical joker with you uh, when you and I, you know, when he and I were, were alone. I mean, I used to stay at his house. Now here's a guy that, one of the guys that's running the family. Uh, and uh, he'd run across the street and get, get coffee for us and uh, a hard butter roll. We'd come back, we'd sit around. Uh, he'd be in his underwear, I'd be in my underwear. Uh, and we'd be drinking coffee, watching the cartoons, and, and, and eating a buttered roll. And talking about, well, this is what we're gonna do today, that, you know, and, you know, talk about his kids. Uh, I, I mean, he, he wasn't a bad guy to be around. The two men would spend hours together, often up on Sonny's roof, feeding his beloved racing pigeons. He loved those pigeons. You know, like I said, we'd go up every morning and he'd feed them and change their water and give me a, give me a history lessons on pigeons. I mean, I never listened to it, but <laughs> I had told the FBI guys, when those pigeon coops come down, you can say goodbye to Sonny Black. You know he's gone. Pistone now discovered that one faction of the Bonanno family, known as the Zips, were major drug importers. Narcotics agent Frank Panessa the Zips were Sicilians brought over to run the pizza shops that they had all over the, uh, New York and Pennsylvania, not only to distribute the heroin, but to use these Zips for murders and anything else that they needed from them. The FBI launched a major investigation into the Zips pizza restaurant drug trade, but they couldn't act on it while Pistone was still undercover. If his identity was revealed, he would be killed instantly. Selwyn Rapp. Every day going to work like that, knowing he could easily be made or betrayed, and his life would have been worthless. And yet he did it for years. FBI organized crime coordinator, Jim Kostler. As long as the person's undercover, you can't do anything with that information until they surface or you jeopardize them. Another threat to Pistone's life surfaced as Tony Mira, one of his first contacts in the Bonanno family was released from jail. And Mira now learned that Pistone was now bringing in good money for Sonny Black and Lefty. What you have to remember, there's a lot of jealousy and envy in the mob. Uh, you're making more money than, they, than, than the next guy. You're closer to the boss than the next guy. Mira gets out of jail and he's jealous because he thinks I'm making a lot of money and because I'm, I'm real close to Sonny Black. Uh, so he goes and, and uh, he goes to his captain and says that I should be with him and not Lefty because uh, he's the one that brought me around uh, and introduced me to Lefty and then he went to jail. Determined to get his way, Mira called a gathering of the Bonanno family captains asking that they arbitrate the decision. During the sit downs, uh, Lefty and Sonny are telling me, you know, what's going on. Anything that, that wasn't going his way and, you know, he was irritated with, yeah. Uh, and he was kind of ticked off because of uh, uh, my first association with Mira, but, you know, hey, that's who I, you know, that's who I met in the beginning. Uh, and he was ticked off because, you know, he thought I was, even Lefty thought, you know, was jealous of how, how close I, I got to Sonny, you know. Uh, and I put, you know, and he felt like I put him in a, in a bad position, you know, uh, because of how close I was with him, so. But. Sonny Black and Lefty won their argument and got to keep Pistone, but the volatile Tony Miro wasn't finished yet. He figures, well, if I can't have him, nobody's gonna have him. So then what uh, Miro does is uh, 
he puts in the beef with all the captains uh, that uh, that I stole two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars in a drug deal that we were involved in, and uh, you know that's a no no. You don't steal money from the family, so, so uh, they have a sit down, and uh, Sonny Black wins the sit down. Now he's he's still ticked off. He's still mad, so. He brings in some other guys. He brings in a, uh, some guys from Canada, Bonanos from Canada, who he says, you know, these guys will back him that I stole his money. So they have another sit down. The accusations were so severe that a series of high level meetings called sit downs were arranged to judge the accusations leveled at Pistone. If you lose a sit down, they're not gonna, you're gonna get killed right then. I mean, it's not like, you know, they're gonna give you you know, we're going to give you a month to get your affairs in order. Rocky admitted that you made two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Who did Rocky tell you? Anthony Merritt and his men. Don't oh, you understand? He's a lying son of a fucking check up. He's a lying son of. He's lying, left. I don't give a fuck. If he's a liar. I never cut any junk money up with him. Why don't fucking count? Why does this guy want to? You know, she wants him? you bad. So what do we do now? I don't give a fuck. But you can't I'm afraid help me of anybody. You can't help me out. I have to handle it without you. And I ain't afraid of mirror either. When's this thing all gonna end with this? It guy? ain't gonna end. Sonny Black wins the sit down. But Pistone had made a serious enemy in Tony Mira. And Pistone's FBI handlers were growing increasingly concerned that the operation was becoming just too dangerous. They were talking about closing the operation down. By the end of 1980, Pistone had been undercover in the Mafia for nearly five years. And the intelligence he'd uncovered was enabling the FBI to target the Mafia like never before. Pistone pleaded with his boss, Jules Bonavolante, to let him continue. I convinced Jules there's nothing to worry about, you know? I mean, I, I, I can handle this. Bonavolante agreed, but Pistone's operation would soon be thrown into another crisis after the break. When investigating a murder, the first 48 hours are the most crucial. On a new podcast, Marsha Clark Investigates the First 48, famed prosecutor and defense attorney Marsha Clark delves into some of the most controversial homicides in America. These are cases that have shocked and captivated the public, but have outcomes that are either unresolved or leave more questions than answers. Now Marsha will speak with experts, review the facts, and use her own expertise to shed new light on cases which have been left in the darkness. Subscribe to Marsha Clark, The First 48, to catch a new episode every week on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite shows. On January 17, 1981, Sonny Black and some friends flew down to Florida for Las Vegas night at the King's Court. An evening of craps, roulette, and blackjack. The local sheriff had been paid off to turn a blind eye. As I was right there when he paid the guy off, the guy assured us that everything was taken care of, you know? At first, the evening was a great success. The place was mobbed. King's Court was mobbed. Had all kind of money. Uh, I mean, we were making all kind of money. And... Uh, Every so often, Rossi would collect the money and, and go hide it because we didn't want all that money out on, you know, on a table. Uh, at some point in time, it, and we had an old-fashioned uh, slot machine that nobody was even using. I mean, it was just a, uh, it was an ornament. But when the night was in full swing, something went terribly wrong. Eventually, at some point in time, knock on the door, and it's sheriff's deputies. So uh, eventually, we had to let him in. And uh, but before we let him in, every we, we had everybody take the money off the tables, you know, uh, and we put the chips out. Uh, so, uh, but they came in and they saw the slot machine, and uh, they they busted and arrested us and. Uh, but what we did was, before we let him in, we, we told all the people to go, to go out the back door because we didn't want, you know, 
legitimate people going to a casino. So we let them out the back door. Uh, so they, they came in and they arrested us. They, they wrecked the place. The club was raided by local deputies and Sonny, who refused to provide identification, was arrested and jailed. Sonny spent the night in a, in a camp. He wasn't too happy the next day, believe me. <laughs> he wasn't too happy the next day. It was a major embarrassment for Sonny. And worse, much of their takings had also been taken. The money that Tony had hidden was gone, was gone. Uh, he contacted the undersheriff and, you know, he gave him some BS story about uh, he couldn't go to work that night or whatever. Uh, and uh, he was sorry, but, you know, what could he do? Uh, so that kind of ticked off Sonny because it made us look bad in, in the eyes of Trafficani. Uh, so Sonny had a squared away with Trafficani about the bust. Sonny Black was suspicious. But he thought there was a, uh, he thought there was a rat, you know, and uh, an informant. And I said, Sonny, there wasn't, you know. In the beginning, I was, I was concerned, you know, maybe Sonny would be ticked off at me, but he really wasn't. He was more mad at, uh, at, at Rossi. Uh, but then I said, Sonny, it wasn't his fault. I was right there when he paid off the undersheriff, which I was. I said, I was right there when he paid the guy off. Uh, the guy assured us that everything was taken care of. And then it came out later that, that somebody that had lost money had gone and complained to the sheriff's department and said, you know, I was down at King's Court and, and, uh, and I lost X amount of money, you know. So that's when they sent out the deputies. But Pistone's carefully maintained cover was in danger. Months earlier, Pistone had borrowed a luxury boat from the FBI for a fishing trip to impress Lefty Ruggiero. But now, Lefty had spotted an article in a magazine detailing an FBI sting operation in which agents had posed as Arab sheikhs to entrap corrupt congressmen. The article included a picture of a boat used in the operation. It was the same boat. The boat that we used was on the front page of uh, Newsweek, another major undercover operation going called Abscam. It wasn't supposed to get uh, surfaced for a long time. Uh, but what happened to us is it, it got exposed. Lefty demanded to know how Donnie Brasco had got hold of an FBI boat. Oh, I told Lefty, remember this girl we met out in San Diego? And, you know, do you remember she said her brother had a boat in, in Miami and that we can use it any time? So I said, look, Left, I said, you were there, you know. Even if, it, even if it is a government boat, they were after, you know, they're after the politicians. They're, they weren't after us. They never came after us. So I got away with that one. It was the first time he'd been doubted by either Lefty or Sonny. And Pistone worried that maybe they no longer completely trusted him. But soon afterwards, Pistone was given an astonishing vote of confidence by Sonny Black. Sonny and I, uh, actually, we, we, were, we were having dinner at a restaurant in Brooklyn called Creasy's. It was just myself and Sonny. And he told me that, uh, the first thing he said to me, he said, Donnie, you got any drug arrests? I says, no, Lefty, I don't have any arrests for drugs. I don't, you know, he knew I didn't, I didn't fool around with drugs. I mean, other than, you know, the operations that we did. I said, no. And he said, that's good. He said, uh, he says, I, I put your name, I propose you for a membership. Sonny Black had proposed Pistone to become a made man, a full member of the mafia. He had to go to every captain in the family and, and say, hey, I'm going to propose Donnie Brasco. You guys have anything against Donnie? And if one captain says a negative thing, they can't propose you. The captain's okayed it, so. Sonny and Lefty had even removed Pistone's one obstacle to becoming made, the tradition that he should have killed someone. Sonny and Lefty had already, you know, lied for me and said I had, I had killed somebody, you know, because you have to make your bones to become a member. They already lied for me. Uh, I passed, all the captains gave me the thumbs up. 
If Pistone became a made man, he would have access to some of the most powerful mobsters in America. So, of course, I had to report that. So when I reported it back to, uh, in fact, I reported to Bonavolante, Jules. And uh, uh, at first, you know, everybody was for it. But at FBI HQ, the initial excitement was soon replaced with real concern that having an agent inducted to such a senior level could compromise the entire operation. Jim Kostler. Theoretically, to become a member, you have, would have had to kill somebody. And their, their position was that even though he had not had to kill somebody, that that would destroy his credibility for the courts. And then dramatic events within the Bonanno crime family ramped up the FBI's concerns further, as author Selwyn Rabb explains. The Bonanno family was in trouble in the late 70s and early 80s. There were actually two factions. Uh, after Joe Bonanno, who had created the family, sort of semi-retired, the family was in dispute. And there were more than at least two factions fighting for control. And one of the factions was led by, led by someone by the name of Rusty Rustelli, and Sonny Black was on his side. And there were a group of capos on another side who uh, wanted to take over the family. Now, one of the reasons you want to take over family is that money in the mafia flows upwards. If you're running it, boy, you're going to be wealthy pretty quickly. So it wasn't a question of just uh, effective leadership. It was a question that always boils down to the most essential fact in organized crime, at least in the Mafia or Cosa Nostra, who gets the uh, lion's share of the loot? Sonny Black had look, hooked up actually with someone by, with another important capo by the name of Joe Messina. And their idea was to end this dispute in the family by killing three rival capos. And uh, Messina was the guy who really dreamed up this whole atmosphere, how they were going to do it. Sonny and those loyal to Rusty Rostelli were to take out three rival capos. They killed these guys May 5th. And I was aware a couple days later that something was going to happen. Uh, because, you know, because talking to Lefty and Sonny and, you know, Lefty says, look, I, I got to go somewhere. Uh, and, and actually, uh, they wanted me to go on these hits. Sonny uh, wanted to bring me on these hits. And then after discussions, uh, they decided, no, let's leave Donnie out of it uh, because we might need him later on to do something. So um, I didn't go on the hits. But be a couple days before I left, he said, look, we're, you know, uh, we're going to be out of touch for a while. You keep in touch with, with, uh, with my wife. Make sure you call her every day. And if I have anything to relate to you, you know, uh, she'll tell you. So I had to call, you know, I had to call his wife every day. Uh, and then finally, uh, a couple days after the hits, uh, she said, all right, he'll be home. He wants you to make sure you call him at 6.30 tonight. And that's when he said, uh, he said, those guys went bye-bye, everything's gonna be all right, blah, 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 blah. As the violence escalated, there was an ever-increasing risk that Pistone could be caught in the crossfire. Now that this war was going on, uh, this is the first time every, everybody's carrying a gun now. Sonny Black gave me a gun to carry. Uh, guys that were with the other three captains were looking to, to kill us. FBI former assistant director and special ops agent James Kalstrom. He was involved in some of the most vicious territorial uh, wars that were going on in organized crime. So he was right there at the focus point. And then Sonny Black put Pistone in a position that he and his FBI handlers had been desperate to avoid. It's a shooting war, it's not, it's not a verbal war anymore. And then Lefty tells me, uh, you gotta be at the, at, uh, the club, Sonny wants to talk to you. Uh, and he basically told me what it was. Sonny ordered Pistone to track down a man called Bruno Indelicato, a rival gangster. That's when Sonny tells me he wants me to give me the contract to kill, uh, kill Bruno. Pistone contacted his FBI handlers. I uh, called Jules, told him, you know, Sonny had given me the contract to kill uh, Bruno and Delicata, who was the son of one of the captains, Sonny Red and Delicata, that got killed. Uh, so the FBI wanted to uh, 
bring the operation to a close. Pastone tried to persuade Jules Bonavolante to hang on in there just a little longer. But it was every day, you know, trying to convince them that, you know, look, nothing's going to happen to me, you know. Uh, let's, let's, let us, let's go to, to December. Uh, and Sonny had set up another meeting with Traffic Canny, and it was for the end of July. Uh, so that was like in June. So I finally convinced Jules, I said, Jules, we got one more meeting with Traffic Canny. Nothing's happened up until this point, you know, another month is not going to make any difference. You know, hoping that once we get to the other month that I can convince him, you know, to go to December. Bonavolante agreed to give Pistone one last throw of the dice. Together, they devised a plan to get around the hit on Bruno Indelicato. So Sonny sends me to Florida because that's where they thought Bruno was. And the plan was if I found him, I'd call the FBI, they'd snatch him, we'd make it look like a hit. And then I can go back and say, you know, I took care of him. The stone was poised to execute the plan. But the FBI ultimately decided it was far too dangerous. It was time to end the operation. FBI organized crime coordinator Jim Kostler recalls. Headquarters said no. And that was the day we pulled the plug on him. That was when we pulled the plug. In fact, I remember it like yesterday. It was the day that uh, Charles and Diane got married. It was, it was the day that we brought down that operation. After six long years spent undercover in the mob, living the life of Donny Brasco, Pistone was ordered to pull out. When we ended the operation, he was very upset because I'm sure he felt that if he could have been made, his credibility would have been enhanced. The Bureau took the opposite position. Can you imagine the kick in the ass when it comes out, you know, Bonanno Mafia family makes FBI, undercover FBI agent? But I, I, I couldn't convince him, so we had a surface. There's more to the story after the break. Are you the kind of cinephile who's been known to use IMDb to track the timeline of someone's career? Or have you predicted opening weekend earnings with your friends? <laughs> then you should be listening to Blank Check with Griffin and David. The hosts are comedian and star of Amazon's The Tick, Griffin Newman, and the Atlantic senior film critic, David Sims. They review directors' complete bodies of work episode to episode. But not just any directors, the auteurs whose early successes afforded them the rare blank check from Hollywood to make their own crazy, big-budget passion projects. And sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce, baby. Blank Check highlights how accomplished directors use or abuse the freedom earned through escalating critical and commercial successes. If you're listening to Doug Loves Movies or The Flop House or How Did This Get Made, then Blank Check will be your new favorite podcast. Listen to Blank Check on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite shows. Two weeks later, with Pistone safely out of the way, Sonny was visited by FBI agents at his club. So in rap. They went to Sonny Black and told him what was going to happen. Showed him a picture of uh, Joe Pistone, who the real Joe Pistone, with FBI agents that uh, Sonny Black knew were FBI agents. The plan was uh, for me to, when, when uh, I was going to come out, was we, they were going to send a couple agents to see Sonny Black. And uh, <clears throat> the reason was is that they figured that uh, uh, by going to Sonny, they had, they had wiretaps up, and by going to Sonny that uh, he would get on the phone and what we say in law enforcement, a tickle of wires, you know, talk to a different individual, talk to, you know, other members of the crew about, about it. Uh, so they sent three agents, and one of them uh, knew Sonny from working organized crime. And they went and told him that, uh, they showed him a picture of me, and he's really another cover FBI agent. And, uh, and Sonny said, well, if I see him around, then now I'll know. I mean, he really didn't believe it. Because uh, I had talked to, I had talked to the agents later on, and they said he, he really didn't believe it. And then uh, uh, they left. And then Sonny, you know, Sonny called Lefty and called Nicky and called the other guys in the crew and they had a meeting that uh, they thought that uh, the FBI had kidnapped me or was trying to turn me into an informant. Eventually, 
Sonny Black began to accept the truth and weigh his options. As the man responsible for bringing Donnie Brasco into the Mafia, he knew he would be killed. The FBI hoped this realization could help them flip Sonny Black. The FBI offered him protection. All he had to do was come forward. He said no. He knew what the results might be, but he wouldn't betray his oath. He decided to go down at the end, and he knew pretty much that he was on a hit list. And sure enough, shortly after that meeting with the FBI, he got notification uh, that he was wanted for some kind of sit-down in Staten Island, one of the boroughs in New York. Uh, Messina had arranged this, his uh, now uh, real rival, uh, and he also decided one way of uh, perhaps camouflaging the hit, making it look like it was a real important meeting. Uh, he told Sonny Black, and Sonny Black knew that uh, another, a, ma a member of the family, a consigliere, would be along. This was to try to put Sonny Black off his guard, that if a consigliere was there, Nothing wrong could go down, and he knew the consigliere was a friend of his. But Sonny Black had been a wise guy long enough to know what would happen. Sonny got a call and went, had to go to his meeting, and before he went, uh, he went into the motion lounge and, and gave the bartender all his jewelry, some of his money, uh, all his keys except his car keys, and said, I just got called to a sit-down. I want you to hold on to this stuff because I'm probably not coming back. And he went to the sit-down. <laughs> he knew he wasn't coming back from it. Sonny Black was picked up, and sure enough, when he got to this uh, building or his home in Staten Island, he was told that the meeting was in the basement. As he walked down in the basement, a hitman behind him shot him when he rolled down to the uh, when he rolled down to the end. Another hitman was waiting, and uh, the first shots didn't kill him. And Sonny Black said, uh, do it right, something to that effect. Make it finish me off. And they did. I, I remember I, I, told, uh, I told Jules and I think I, think I even told Costler is that uh, when you see those pigeon coops on the top of Sonny's apartment building getting torn down, he's dead. 17 days later, they start taking the pigeon coops down and that's when they, they killed him. Soon afterwards, a body was found, dumped in the Hudson River. I was on the stand testifying when they found Sonny Black's body. They had found it, but they, they, uh, they hadn't identified it. And then finally, through dental records, uh, they identified his body. Uh, and he was in a body bag. They had cut off his hands. Uh, and it was, uh, I think it was somewhere around the Verrazano Bridge, I'm not mistaken. We, the FBI had gotten a call from, uh, from a female and, uh, who I had met during, during the undercover operation. And uh, <clears throat> she was a friend of Sonny Black's. And she said, I'd like to talk to, to Donnie. Uh, so they called me and said, you know this? And I said, yeah, I know who she is. So they, uh, they picked her up and they drove her to D.C. And we sat down over lunch. And uh, she says, um, she, she says, you know, she says, after uh, the agents had, had come and talked to Sonny, Sonny had called her and uh, had told her, you know, what happened. And uh, he said to her, I don't believe that Donnie's a, an agent. And, you know, and he said, but uh, uh, I really loved that kid, he said. He said that if he was, he was doing his job. And he did his job better than we did ours. I didn't want to see him get killed, but, you know, he, he brought it upon himself. You know, when, when the agents went to talk to him, he could have easily called them later on and said, look, I'm coming in, you know. What kind of deal can I make? But he didn't. I said, you know, he, he, was a, he was a real man and he was a real gangster. And that, that's, that's how we left it. The Mafia now moved to take out anyone who'd had any involvement with Donnie Brasco. They killed Sonny Black. They killed Tony Mira. They killed Jilly. Did I want to see him get killed? 
No. Would I rather have him gone to jail? Yeah. But it wasn't my doing, in my mind, that got him killed. Lefty Ruggiero was next on the mob's hit list, but the FBI had other ideas. Lefty had gotten a phone call at his house that they wanted to see him, you know, come down to a meeting. And uh, when Lefty got there, they were going to they were going to kill him. Uh, well, the FBI grabbed him outside of his apartment and, uh, and arrested him then. Uh, he thought it was a hit team, uh, you know, because the agents were in, in surveillance clothes, just in, you know, nondescript cars. And uh, he thought he was going to get clipped. Uh, but he was relieved when the... Lefty Ruggiero was imprisoned for conspiring to murder the three capos distributing drugs, extortion, bank robbery, and illegal gambling in Florida. So he spent like 15 years in jail. I hate to be the guy that was, was his cellmate or, <laughs> or guard, because he had to be the biggest pain in the arse there ever was. The FBI used Pistone's information to go after hundreds of mobsters. And as James Callstrom recalls, Joe Pistone was a witness in trial after trial. Well, Joe was a fantastic uh, witness, and uh, he was really there to corroborate. He wasn't there to give his first-hand recollection, although he did. But typically, he would be corroborating and adding some filler, really, to the, what we had on electronic surveillance and ba providing background for the jury. And, of course, providing extremely uh, valuable testimony as to the the personalities and the infighting and the rackets involved. He was really the frosting on the cake. I think I testified in about 17 different trials. We had uh, 235 convictions. And then, of course, in New York, you know, we knocked out the Bonanno family to a great extent. Jim Kostler. Bonanno family, as I know of it, I, I, don't, I think they are nothing but a street gang at this point in time. In Milwaukee, we took down the whole family, you know, the boss, the, uh, the underboss, a couple of his captains, the same thing in Florida, you know. In 1985, Pistone testified in the trial of the Sicilian heroin trafficker, the Zips. Known as the Pizza Connection, it was one of the longest trials in American history. One thing that I think that uh, good came from our case, uh, if I'm not mistaken, almost Every affidavit on following mafia cases had information from our case in there in, in some way or another. Uh, the Pizza Connection case, uh, we had, you know, in the beginning, like South Catalano and a lot of the, a lot of Sicilians, we had identified in our case. Uh, they weren't really known to, you know, to law enforcement as how much power they had here in the States. Uh, so a lot of that information as far as the identification, because I had met uh, Catalano and, um, and Baldo, we had provided a lot of the information on, 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 these, on the Sicilian faction. Uh, so we gathered a lot of good intelligence information and evidentiary information that was used in, in a lot of the other cases. And in what became known as the commission trial, Pistone identified the heads of the New York families. The FBI, a guy by the name of Pat Marshall, who was an agent, uh, put together the commission trial where uh, he indicted all the bosses in New York uh, and convicted them. Pistone's evidence and testimony played a crucial part in securing convictions on 151 counts. James Kallstrom. In his case, it was the probably the textbook of how to do it, uh, and it was important uh, in a little segment that he hung out with, the little regime that he worked with. Uh, but overall, I think it was the thrust of, of uh, a change in policy at the highest levels of the FBI and the Department of Justice. It was the ability to train, equip, and spend the time to put the resources together uh, to develop the intelligence uh, to prove the conspiracies. And uh, it was all that together with great case agents uh, run by Jim Costler and others and great prosecutors that really brought down organized crime. 
and all those things were critically important. The Stones' daring operation spelled the beginning of the end for the mob, as gangsters at all levels were sent down. The impact it had on, on the way the FBI dealt with the mafia was that we showed they weren't invincible. And uh, we brought out and, and, and showed a lot of the illegal activities that they were involved in that we could uh, charge them with. Uh, and, and, and basically that we can go after and get the upper echelon versus, you know, versus the guys on the bottom doing all the dirty work. Uh, and, you know, uh, guys like uh, Jimmy, guys like Costler, Bruce, Jules, uh, they saw that and uh, they, they started to, uh, to emphasize, you know, using the RICO to get these guys. But Joe Pistone, uh, a fantastic FBI agent, a real hero, and should be seen as a hero by the American public. Someone who actually put his life on hold to really get to the, the root of uh, a segment of organized crime in the United States, and put his life on, on the line, really. And a lot of what we knew about organized crime in the, in the realm of where Joe operated uh, was because of his professionalism. And I take my hat off to Joe Pistone. He did a great job. Pistone had survived six years undercover in the mob and escaped. But he would never be completely free of them. The mafia had put a $500,000 bounty on Pistone's head. To this day, he lives under a pseudonym in an undisclosed location. On the next episode, you had very strict divisions between the various ethnic gangs. Jews didn't even go into Italian neighborhoods. A boy from a poor background who became a vicious gangster with a psychopathic lust for murder. Ben Siegel wasn't a make pretend tough guy. He was an out and out killer. But when he refused to play by the mob's rules, he became a marked man. There was a, uh, a pecking order in the mafia and the mob does not like to be screwed over. The embodiment of a twisted American dream. And he dreamed all the way to Las Vegas. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. He's the guy who dreamt up Las Vegas. He put the glitz and glamor into Sin City. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. This has been an Audio Boom original. Thanks to ShipStation for supporting this episode of Mafia. Follow Mafia on Spotify or rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite shows.